Uh, welcome to this Washington History Seminar. As most of you know, I'm Christian Osterman. I run the History and Public Policy Program here. I'm delighted to co-chair this seminar on historical perspectives on international, international and national affairs um, with the National History Center. Um, and um, since Roger Lewis is uh, off on Thanksgiving break, we have the great pleasure of having uh, Jim Grossman uh, f uh, from the AHA um, and the National Coalition for History um, join us here as co-chair uh, um, for this session. Uh, and he, in fact, knows more about the subject than I do, so I'm delighted that, uh, that he's here. Um, as always, uh, I'd like to express our gratitude to the Society of Historians of um, Foreign Relations. Please come in. Oh. <laughs> got, got scared off. Okay. Um, society the terrifying of introduction <laughs> you're offering there, obviously. I know. Uh, to Schaefer for co-sponsoring this meeting. Thanks to the National History Center and the AHA uh, for their support. Uh, let me remind you that uh, next week, um, next Monday, we'll have Jim Hirschberg talking about his new tome on Vietnam. Um, and of course, um, I'd like to ask you to <coughs> silence your cell phones so we can have an hour and a half of, um, of uh, good focused discussion here. Please move, move up. Um, it is with great pleasure that uh, I welcome uh, to the center Professor Phyllis K. Leffler, um, who is the director of the Institute for Public History and professor at the University of Virginia. Her field of interest is public history, and she's published, she publishes in the area of museum studies and institutional culture. She has served as the president of Congregation Beth Israel in Charlottesville, served on the board of the Southern Jewish Historical Society, and has taught courses in Southern Jewish history and on Jewish museums. Uh, earlier, she served as assistant dean in the College of Arts and Sciences and was on the board of the Charlottesville Hillel. Currently, she's completing a book related to explor explorations in, black leader in the Black Leadership Project, co-directed with Julian Bond. That's, in fact, what she, I think, will uh, presentation today will be based on this project. The book provides a analytical framework for the stories of close to 50 black leaders interviewed as part of a large oral history project. Phyllis is also continuing to explore the history of the University of Virginia during the 20th century and uh, has a particular interest in understanding how the university evolved in, during the course of this century to become the leading public institution uh, uh, in America. Leffler's the author uh, with Joseph Brent on public history, a philosophy and paradigm, paradigm and public history readings. She has published numerous award-winning articles in the Public Historian and the magazine of Virginia History and Biography. Most recently, authored Black Families and Fostering of Leadership uh, in Ethnicities. She holds uh, degrees from Queens College uh, um, of the City University of New York at the University of Sussex in England and a PhD from Ohio State University. And with that, um, I'll turn it over to my co-chair, Jim Grossman, for some introductory words, and then we'll save ourselves the going around the, uh, the table and turn, go straight uh, to Phyllis Leffler. Jim? Yeah, usually the introductory words are the introduction to going around the table. And uh, we're going to try to we're we're going to try to move a little more quickly today because it's a larger group than usual. Uh, I do want to just to give uh, offer a sense of context for those of you who, uh, after you leave here, are further intrigued. Is that this is a project that uh, I assume exists in conversation with uh, a bunch of other ones, and that's one of the interesting things about it is that oral histories of African American leaders. Uh, is a burgeoning field. And the, the most important one, in addition to this one, is, is something called History Makers, uh, which is based in Chicago, which are video interviews. Uh, and then 
not oral histories, but uh, another project that is trying to uh, look at black leadership uh, in sort of a large contextual way is called blackpast.org, which is based at the University of Washington, Quintard Taylor. So this is something that a lot of people are interested in. And so I think it's, in, in that sense, it's something that, that our conversation might be able to lead you to further explorations uh, afterwards to put it in the context of these other projects. Uh, those of you who, in addition to me, have degrees from the University of California at Berkeley will argue with Phyllis later about the leading institute, leading public university, the leading public university. university. We'll get into that later. I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> it's in my notes, so I don't know who came up with them. But, uh. So, Phyllis, mic is yours. Thank you. It's really delightful to be here. Thank you all so much for coming out on the Monday before Thanksgiving and uh, potentially rainy afternoon. I'm delighted to see you all. In the year 2000, Julian Bond and I began a project at the University of Virginia called Explorations in Black Leadership. To date, we've carried out videotaped interviews with close to 50 leaders. These are men and women who have built careers across a broad spectrum of leadership in the law, in education, in public service, in religious institutions, in media, in the arts, in the military. We have sought to define leadership as broadly as we possibly could. We don't claim that every career path is represented or that this is a statistical sample of any sort. But we have targeted a cross section of black American leaders. We have worked hard to vary our sample by region, by age, and by career trajectory. We've sought a good balance of men and women. Our oldest person in the sample is Oliver Hill, the NAACP lawyer who died in the year 2007 at the age of 100 and who worked alongside Thurgood Marshall as part of the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund team and was one of the lawyers who prosecuted the Brown case in 1954. Our youngest person to date is Bakari Sellers, elected in 2006 at age 22 as the youngest member of the South Carolina General Assembly. Just last week, we completed our newest interview with Bill T. Jones, the avant-garde choreographer, winner of a MacArthur Award and two Tonys, and one of the five recipients of the 2010 Kennedy Center Honors. Why, some might ask, do such a project? What's our underlying purpose? Well, let me begin by saying that while it may be hard to believe, in the year 2000 when we started this project, very little attention was being paid to black leadership. There were dozens of books that were being produced about leadership and leaders, but black Americans were rarely featured in those books. Further, when we started the project, we were four years away from the 50th anniversary of the Brown v. Board of Education decision, and we knew that there were many questions about its success, as indeed there still are, but we wanted to know what impact the Brown decision and the subsequent civil rights era had on those who rose to leadership positions. We also wanted to learn more about what black leaders themselves thought was responsible for their own success. Subsequently, our study broadened from these questions, but our initial impulse was to record the views of older black leaders about this critical time in American history. We also believe that too often people of color feel hidden from sight. Some might say that this has all changed now with the election of Barack Obama, with the previous leadership of people like Condoleezza Rice and Colin Powell, with the growing number of congressional representatives and executive leaders. But others would claim that these people are still viewed as exceptions to the rule and that the color line still creates obstacles to success. Leadership and the qualities, the experiences, and the role models that foster leadership, especially black leadership, 
need to be closely examined in our view precisely because the racial divide in America is not contracting but is in fact widening. And those findings about leadership need to be reflected back into the community. So we believe that we have much to learn from these leaders. The archive that we have compiled, good, the archive that we have compiled is available online, organized topically and fully searchable. It's a resource that can be used for teaching and for research. Individual video clips can be selected by topic. You can actually go to an individual name and then the whole interview comes up, but it has been subdivided by topic. Or the full transcript can be viewed. So the archive stands on its own and we're, we would be delighted for people to use it and, and uh, make use of it either for their own research or for teaching purposes. But about four years ago, I decided, in part because so many people were telling me how moved they were by these materials, and also because of my own understanding of how rich some of these discussions were, about four years ago I decided that this material was so very rich uh, that I wanted to do more with it than just leave it as an archive. I wanted to synthesize what had been learned from this remarkable group of people. I wanted to create what I call a collected biography in which the black leaders would tell their own stories. I wanted this biography as much as possible to reflect the commonalities across <coughs> time, across gender, region, and class. The book, tentatively called Conversations in Black Leadership, seeks to link the private and the public the personal and the professional. The book focuses on how personal experiences and historical circumstances ignited leadership possibilities for black Americans. This is ultimately an exploration of black leadership in America through the eyes of those leaders themselves. Robert Archibald, president of the Missouri History Museum and author of a book called A Place to Remember, Using History to Build Community, this was a book that was published in 1999, tells us that individual memories are critical for our sense of the present and the future. He writes, our bodies, our brains, and our memories seek to create a dream, a myth, a map that allows us to survive and to function throughout our lives. We are story makers. How we interpret the story, how we feel about the past incidents of our lives will influence the story still to come. And from a slightly different perspective, Jeanetta Cole put it another way. She wrote, autobiography becomes a reflection of the realities of the lives of millions of African Americans, the realities of their oppression, the realities of their journey towards liberation and self-determination. It is the memories and, and self-reflections of our interviewees that I seek to capture in this book. The book is organized um, around a series of concentric circles, beginning with the most intimate and expanding to the more public and generic leadership influences. After a couple of introductory chapters examining why we should study black leadership, and also examining the role of the oral tradition. The five concentric circles that I explore are those of family, education, <coughs> networks and connections, the importance of the Brown decision, and the civil rights movement. A final chapter then focuses on leadership lessons. The book integrates the personal memories of our interviewees along with materials from autobiographies, other interviews, and secondary materials that create more of a contextual framework. In black America, many aspects of past injustices create painful memories, memories that can often stifle otherwise productive lives. 
Those who experience the indignities of colored water fountains, colored bathrooms, poorly equipped and poorly heated schools, saw an America that closed rather than opened doors. Those who experience the hatreds and the violence of the Klan and of white supremacists had to learn to overcome fear. They had to internalize self-pride and self-worth. And in the remainder of this talk, what I plan to do as I talk about the main themes of this book is I plan to share with you um, some of the video clips from these interviews because the book actually, it, the book um, seeks to privilege these voices as much as possible. So I thought I would give you a bit of a taste today um, ab about what it is that these people themselves say. So the first um, African-American mayor of Richmond, hmm. whoops, sorry, we'll go back. The first African-American mayor of Richmond and now a Virginia state senator, a man by the name of Henry Marsh, still remembers the injustices of segregation. Whoops, that's not right. It's he probably remembers them too, though. Sorry. Mm -hmm. You know, we grew up with segregation and uh, we didn't like it. Uh, we resented it, we were disgusted by it. But we accepted it because it was the law. Um, I guess the way it affected us directly was we had to ride the bus to school. And uh, we had to get up from our seats and move to the back of the bus when white people got on the bus. And my sister and I rode the same bus. And it didn't bother me as much, but she had to get up to give her seat to a white man because they had gotten to that point on the bus. It, it, it infuriated me. I mean, I was disgusted by it. And, uh, you know, because I knew she was, she had to get up because she was black. I didn't like getting up myself, but when I saw her get up, it really bothered me. And that, those were the kind of things that the, um, we couldn't shop in the stores, downtown department stores, uh, restrooms. When I went to F Miami, Florida for the first time with my fraternity brothers, uh, it was in 1954, and I joined the fraternity and my, my fa faculty advisors decided they would treat me and my buddy to a trip to Miami. On the only way down there, when we stopped at a service station to go to the restroom, the uh, owner said, nigga, niggas don't use these restrooms. Get out of there. Don't you go in that restroom. We, of course, have many such stories. This is just one um, illustrative one. And these stories are, of course, not new. But what interested us was how people managed to prevail in the face of such humiliations and such disadvantages. Our interview subjects as a group speak about the importance of parents, extended kin, teachers, and mentors. These role models sent messages that looked beyond the stigma implicit in racial segregation. These mentors simply refused to accept the white supremacist paradigm. They emphasized the importance of transcending the traditional barriers that existed. And by doing so, these teachers and mentors empowered young people still in their formative years to believe in themselves and to excel. The key was confidence. With confidence, they could conquer the customary blockades imposed by segregation and the embedded racist attitudes that they confronted every day. Self-respect was linked to that confidence and frequently led to the vision that dedicated individuals could help spur social change through their leadership. These interviews frequently reveal that such messages of confidence and self-respect came first and foremost from parents and from other elders who were part of their upbringing. I'd like you to listen to Vernon Jordan, the former executive of the United Negro College Fund, the former president of the National Urban League, 
and a longtime civil rights activist, attorney, and political insider, speaking about the way in which he was taught to deal with the indignities. And I want to suggest, too, that you pay attention to some of the pauses as well, because I think it's in sometimes in some of those pauses that you can feel uh, the power of what he's saying. What I knew when I had to go to the Butler Street Y is that I had to get on the streetcar and that I had to sit in the back. Mm -hmm. And I knew that if I somewhere downtown had to go to the bathroom, I would have to go to the colored bathroom, or if I wanted water, I had to drink colored water. But I was also trained by my mother to go to the bathroom before I left home to drink whatever water I wanted so that I not, did not have to confront the insult of inferiority or a statement about inferiority. So you sort of prepared yourself. Going through downtown Atlanta was it, it was it was it was like uh, it was it was getting through it, and you didn't worry about it because you went from Universal Homes on the streetcar through downtown. You changed for a change, changed uh, uh, streetcars, and then when you got on the other side, you were back in the community, and so you went from one that was all yours through this sort of segregated village and then back to where you were. And there was, I think, probably some comfort in that. I just got to go through this downtown, but I don't have to deal with these people. I don't have to look at them. They're not going to look at me. Uh, but I also remember this, Julian, my mother telling me that despite the fact that you're sitting in the back, you're as good as anybody on that bus. And I never had any doubt that the white children sitting in front, because they were sitting in front, were somehow, were somehow better than me. I don't know why it cut off, but that's, those are the last three words, were somehow better than me. Dorothy Height, born in 1912, 23 years older than Vernon Jordan, grew up in, a very, in very different circumstances. She moved in 1916 at age four with her family from segregated Richmond to the steel manufacturing town of Rankin, Pennsylvania. Her school was in rural Pennsylvania and was integrated. She became a fearless advocate for civil rights and the leader of the movement. Her activism extends back as early as the 1930s when she worked alongside Mary McLeod Bethune and Eleanor Roosevelt through the YWCA. In 1957, she was named the president of the National Council of Negro Women, a position she held in 1998. But she remembers that as a child, her mother, a trained nurse, was unable to find work in hospitals in Pennsylvania and had to take on household work instead. Nonetheless, her mother passed on to her important values. In her interview, she said, but I think my mother was especially helpful to me because even in our little community, she helped to prepare me for a world and a country in which there was discrimination. She always said to me, hold yourself together, think your way through. The parents and mentors in these future leaders' lives emphasized first and foremost the power of education to equip their sons and daughters for a better future. Henry Marsh, uh, who you saw earlier, speaks about his father's inspiration, a man who worked at night to get the resources to bring his family back together after his wife had died and his children had been farmed out to relatives, and a father who then went back to college, demonstrating through his actions a commitment to education. Education, of course, could also exist outside the classroom, and parents, again, were fundamental. Here is Amory Baraka, the founder of the Black Arts Movement in the, in, in the 1960s, more recently poet laureate of New Jersey, and a playwright, talking about his mother's influence. They had every kind of lesson that you can mm -hmm. imagine. I mean, trumpet, piano, 
you know, drum and uh, art, drawing, all those kind of things, which is very interesting because it meant what? It meant that somebody was determined that you were going to know something. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the whole recitation of, uh, you know, the Gettysburg Address and all that, the singing of Ave, Ave Maria. It meant that you were going to know something, that you were mm -hmm. not going to get away from me, darling, without mm -hmm. knowing something. Mm -hmm. And my sister, um, like that too, my sister took ballet lessons, tap dance lessons. Uh, uh, my sister was the only black girl in Newark at the, day, at the time you'd see ice skating. Nobody mm -hmm. else could ice skate. She would be down in the, in the middle of the town ice skating. My mother mm -hmm. and I would be standing there watching her. But, and my sister ended up as a, a dancer on Broadway, you know, uh, you can see her in Cleopatra. Elizabeth Taylor's in the foreground. My sister's in the back playing, uh -huh. you know, one of the African <laughs> girls. But it, that is the result of my mother in the main insisting on mm -hmm. You know, insisting on it. And, and what's amazing to me is the question about the arts, that she was emphasizing the arts for us. Mm -hmm. You know, we were going to be artists. Parents through the power of their personal example can shield their children from the worst abuses in the society. They can model behaviors, values, and goals. They can, through tough love, insist on their children's performance. But we all know that not all children have the benefit of being born into such families where there is even one parent who can set the standard for success. Here is where others within the community can and did make a huge difference for some of our leaders. Jeffrey Canada, for example, founder and executive director of the Harlem Children's Zone in New York, grew up in the South Bronx, one of four boys with an alcoholic and absent father. He was certainly at risk, as he said in some of the books he has published, of either dying on the street or being in jail, as happened to so many of his peer group but he attributes his salvation to a specific teacher who inspired him with books. Oops, sorry. And what about the first grade teacher? Well, first grade, I, I, I had this wonderful teacher in the first grade who uh, was trying to connect with me because I was, I was a kid who was easily distracted. Uh, I had learned sort of the ABCs and stuff like that. And first grade to me was just very boring and I just wasn't focused. And she kept trying to get me focused in the class and she tried everything, painting, and I didn't, wasn't really into the painting. And <laughs> she tried poetry. She just got a book and she started reading this book. And I remember sitting in the back of the classroom and she was reading about this guy who had these eggs, and the eggs were green, and he didn't eat them on a house, and he didn't eat them with a mouse, and he didn't <laughs> eat them here or there. And I had never heard Dr. Seuss before. And I just remember thinking, that is the, that is the most amazing thing I've ever heard. It was just amazing to me. And I, I said, you know, excuse me, could you read that book again? And she read it again to the class, and, and I just... It, it was so great. I had to hear it again. She was like, Jeff, we have to move on. She said, take it home and read it at home. So I took it home and had my mother read it. And the next day I came back to school. Hand was up first thing. Could the teacher, could you read? The, and she said, no, no, I can't read it. Uh, and I was crestfallen. I mean, I just, mm -hmm. and she said, well, go, go in the back and you read it. And I went in the back and I read the book. Uh, in the first grade, I had never been taught to read. And people, when I tell a story, people, don't you know what it takes to teach a kid to read? And I said, yeah, when, when I was at the ed school at Harvard, I taught reading as one of the things that I really took uh, classes in. But I learned to read because this wonderful teacher just kept trying to connect with me until she got to me and just opened up a whole new universe. And when people sometimes say, you know, uh, all children can learn, but they don't really mean it, uh, I know, no, absolutely all children can learn. This is really about whether or not we found the right key to unlock that sort of, I think, uh, uh, great potential that people have inside of them. Charles Ogletree, since 1998, 
the Harvard Law School Jesse Clemenko Professor of Law and Vice Dean for the Clinical Programs, also grew up in, in an incredibly poor surroundings in Merced, California, where his parents did not have the basic literacy to be able to read to him. He recalls that it was teachers and librarians who encouraged his love of reading and uh, who established for what he called a mutually respectful relationship with him and who allowed him to dream of a better life. I dreamed dreams that seemed unimaginable, that I could go places that, that seemed unimaginable before. Uh, I, I could be somebody that I wasn't. I was no longer black or poor. Uh, I was an explorer. I was a creator. Uh, I was an astronomer. I mean, I was all those things I'd read about. Uh, and finally, it sort of uh, relieved, uh, removed the chains, the shackles that I thought I'd had on my mind. It made me imagine then, as a young person who could read and who had confidence, I could do anything. Uh, and that confidence uh, was thick. Sometimes the mentors came from the community. Community for uh, many of these leaders is a wide and very ter varied term. It includes the kind of neighbors that someone like Mary Futrell had growing up in the 1950s who corrected her homework, checked her report card, stepped in as surrogate parents when her widowed mother wasn't home. The black business owners that Vernon Jordan remembers, the black the black businesses were run by actual people that the community knew and respected. They were the local leaders who set aspirations in motion for children, despite the barriers of enforced segregation. Whoops. Sorry. The manager of University of Homes was Alonzo Marone, who was a Harvard Law graduate. He was from the West Indies. He ended up as president of Hampton uh, Institute. Uh, and Mr. Marone was a, he lived in the housing project too, though he was a manager. And, and he walked with authority. He wore a shirt and tie. And he, he, was, he was a leader. And I saw that. And it was, it was an example of what, if I wanted, to be something of what I wanted to be if I did what I needed to do, if I listened to these teachers, I listened to these counselors, and if I followed my parents. My parents' guidance. Others like Bill Gray, the uh, executive director of the United Negro College Fund, who grew up on a college campus, uh, his parents, both educators, also remembers being surrounded by examples of black leadership. In addition to parents, in addition to parents, teachers, and community role models, church leaders also, and the institution of the church itself also played a powerful part in nurturing future leaders. Over and over, these interviewees give significant credit to their churches for providing a strong sense of community. They offered close-knit congregations and black ministers who took time to mentor individual young people to expose them to other significant adults, other strong role models. Robert Franklin, for example, is, is a well-known theologian and author trained at both Harvard and the University of Chicago. He served for many years as the president of the Interdenominational Theological Center in Atlanta, and he's now president of Morehouse College. He remembers the incredibly powerful influence of his pastor, Bishop Henry Lewis Ford. And for some reason, why am I not getting to that? He said, no, we, 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 we have to be more than that. We have to be moral agents. We have to uh, be change agents. And so he was very involved in politics. He, was, uh, he encouraged young people in the congregation to, to go to college. And he provided, he had a, you know, raised money to provide scholarship money and support uh, for young folks uh, pursuing education. 
he certainly made me feel that uh, it was important to understand the language of the larger uh, polis, the larger city, and, and, and the language of, of, of uh, business, uh, the language of politics, uh, the language of um, uh, employed in, in higher education, and not simply to know one's own idiom in the African American community and more specifically in the black church. He pushed us to be uh, open, to, be, uh, to cross barriers. Unfortunately, uh, all too often these interviews uh, reveal a pattern of speaking about tight community connections uh, with a sense of wistfulness, uh, with perhaps a lost pass, a past, suggesting that something important had been lost when the, bounds, when the bonds within these tight-knit supportive communities were loosened with the legal dismantling of segregation. But paired with this sentiment, accurate or not, these witnesses to historic change also advocate the importance of stepping out of sheltering environments. They extol the advantages, especially for young people, of exposure to new worlds. One of those people who speaks about that is Elaine Jones. I think my growing up in my environment, which was warm and wonderful, but was all African American, mm -hmm. all African American. My college was predominantly at that time overwhelmingly African American. Mm -hmm. The African American experience was a part of me, and I knew it, and was part of it, and was home, and I was rooted in it. But I knew that was a bigger world. That's a larger world out there. And in order to function in it, you've got to be exposed to it. You've got to, and the earlier, it's just, the earlier the better. I think my father traveling to Salt Lake City and all over the place and coming back, talking about the things that he had seen, had an impact on me. I also knew that the world was not an African American world. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and um, um, you know, I said, Elaine, you have to be exposed to whites in America. You have to, you know, because you want to function in a larger society. And, 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 and it's because the system has system has to change. For some reason, these clips are just being <laughs> cut off. Um, I don't know why that is, but I can get, tell you the last few words regardless. So Elaine Jones was one of those people who, joined, jo who um, experienced the larger world by joining the Peace Corps and going off to Turkey before she went to law school. Um, others, beginning in the 1930s and 40s, engaged that larger world by challenging the Jim Crow laws that kept black Americans disenfranchised and subjugated. Chipping away at segregated education, they eventually won a huge victory through the Brown decision when separate education was acknowledged as unequal in the form that it existed across America. What we learned from extensive interviews is that Brown v. Board of Education did much more than change de jure racial realities in America. Brown destroyed segregation's legality and empowered thousands of people to overturn what had been perceived up until then as segregation's morality. Brown showed America that there were brilliant legal black scholars who could move the highest courts in the, in the land. Brown revealed that there were brave families willing to come forward as plaintiffs for a larger cause. Subsequently, the disappointments of Brown catalyzed a nonviolent movement for civil rights that changed the fabric of American society. Through the actions of lawyers, average citizens, and college students, Brown and its aftermath fundamentally changed the private consciousness of possibility. That is what so many of the people in these interviews reveal. They were specifically asked what they remembered about the movement when the Brown decision was rendered. All of them old enough to have a strong recollection remember a euphoric sense of achievement, of victory, as you will. Here is Jeanetta Cole, a college student at the time. So you enter Oberlin, 
at a time when Brown v. Board is being announced, the first Brown decision. Do you, what do you remember about it, hearing mm -hmm. about it, talking mm -hmm. about it? What do you mm -hmm. remember about it? I remember just extraordinary jubilation. Mm -hmm. I remember I remember folk thinking that this was a victory of unusual consequences. And for those of us, like myself, who had gone through segregated schools, I think at that moment, I really wasn't in the position to think a lot about all of the values mm. that I had been taught, of the lessons I had learned in the colored schools. I think I really, I think I really fell for it. I think I thought at that moment, like many, many others, that this was the great victory that would lead to enormous Enormous <laughs> progress. <laughs> Many people commented on how Brown set the stage for so much that was to come later. I think uh, at this point I will not show you a wonderful clip that I have from Benjamin Hooks, who was already a lawyer at the time with the NAACP. Um, uh, and, and who also said in this, in this statement that he believed that the largest advance, in, the largest advance that had, that, that Brown, I'm sorry, he, he says, I think that in the largest sense, every advance we've made has been based on Brown. Every single advance. And he says more than that, but in the interests of time, uh, I think I won't show you that right now. So the Brown decision planted hope and possibility for full equality in America. And um, the reality of the first Brown decision then was that Brown was not transformative in terms of its effectiveness, but in terms of its aspiration. And of course, there was then profound disappointment when that didn't happen. But until then, so many people looked to the leadership of p such incredibly powerful role models like Charles Houston, Thurgood Marshall, Oliver Hill, Spotswood Robinson, who inspired a whole generation of young black students of the law. Henry Marsh, again, talked about how he decided on his career in the law on the basis of seeing Oliver Hill in Richmond. He says in uh, another wonderful clip that I wish I had time to show you. That, I think that sorry, in the largest sense, I think that in the law, I think that, I think that in the exactly. largest sense, every advance we've made has been based on. There you Sorry. go. Sorry. OK. Um, so Hen Henry Marsh, um, this is so weird, talks about how he wanted to be a truck driver. He knew nothing else in, in his background growing up. He said the only thing he'd ever seen were trucks moving up and down the road. and. Um, you know, he knew he couldn't do what his uncle did, which was to be an oysterman. So it seemed to him he was, it was exciting to be a truck driver. And when Julian Bond said to him, but how did being a lawyer come to you? He said when he was in high school, he'd heard about Oliver Hill and he was curious. And so again, it was the role model of such a successful lawyer uh, that set in motion his own career path. So out of the legal struggle centered around Brown and a whole host of legal initiatives, an entire generation of leaders emerged who understood the power of the law to affect change. But we all know that Brown didn't accomplish what it promised. And so the disappointments and frustrations and anger with an America often unwilling to accept the law of the land frequently just led to new resolve. And I want to play a wonderful, a wonderful um, clip from 
from Dorothy Height. When did you think about becoming a leader? How do you move this forward? I don't know how to do this. There we go. Sorry. Okay. I want to play this wonderful quick, uh, clip from Dorothy Height, who um, responds to a question about the failure of Brown and its meaning for her. Well, what it has done for me, it has made me realize that I had to work harder to try to make its objectives uh, realize. Uh, I think it, it has been a, it, it gave a new base, however, for working, because at least we had a way of saying segregation uh, is, uh, and there is no such thing as separate and equal. And I think the elimination of that laid the base for all the work that we could do. Until then, I think we were working hard, but we were really up against uh, something that was impossible because segregation was legal. Now, have there been times in your life where you felt a challenge to your philosophy? That you felt <laughs> that your vision? All through my life. <laughs> yeah, all through my life. But I, I have to say, often those who challenge you are like President Kennedy told the civil rights team. He said, Bull Connor will prove to be your best friend. Mm -hmm. Because he had to make clear what he brought out, that which is subtly hidden all around him. Well, I think sometimes those who challenge you are helpful because they make you have to test to what extent is this vision related to something that is real? Is this thing that I'm trying to do? And it also makes you have to say to you, Sir Self, that I have to try a new behavior. Mm. I have to come another way. I have to see who else is ready to work with this. It makes you, it, it, in a sense, it really strengthens leadership if you can survive. So we know that the failures of Brown really um, uh, stimulated uh, uh, the, the civil rights movement. Um, and of course, it's the civil rights movement, which constitutes another chapter in this book, um, which also spawned uh, just dozens and dozens, perhaps hundreds of leaders who got their training as young college students on the front line uh, of, those, of, of that movement. Um, one of those people, of course, was um, Julian Bond, but another one was John Lewis. He found a powerful connection between religious faith and social action, preached so powerfully by a group of ministers who he viewed as mentors. And religion also gave us this sense of hope, that this sense of, yes, you may beat me, you may arrest me, you may jail me, you may shoot and kill me, but in the process, in the process, we are going to redeem the soul of America. And that's what Dr. King preached about on many occasions. We're going to change America. We're going to redeem the soul of America. We're going to make America something different, something better. Lewis here calls attention to the religious aspects of this powerful moral crusade, a crusade that blended religion and patriotism into a civil religion which would challenge the alternative Southern paradigm. And I would suggest that hearing the passion in John Lewis's voice even today underscores how such a philosophy can be transformative to a poor, young Southern black man awakening to the possibilities of change and his own personal leadership role. Others, like Bobby Rush, now a member of the U.S. Congress from Illinois, dedicated himself to political action as a direct result of his involvement with the Black Panther Party. He told us in his interview how uh, his engagement with, with the Panther Party actually opened up a kind of 
political action and led him to understand how change can come through a political process and therefore uh, led him to his current career. For Julian Bond, co-director of this project, the civil rights movement and its early victories allowed him to understand what victory could look like. He had no way of understanding how hard and tough the road would be or how large the problem really was. But having won once, he and his SNCC compatriots believed that they could win again. He describes those years as the most intense of his life, years of meaning and years that created deep friendships that have endured. An army of young people, all in their 20s, developed the strategies, raised the money, did the work, and made the difference. Of these experiences, leadership was born. Now, uh, you get into city politics. Now, uh, you get into city politics. Sorry. I want to do the last one here. There we go. No, it's not the one I want to do. And I think those of us who carried on saw early on victory. We won. We integrated the lunch counters in Atlanta. And I don't think we realized how tough the rest of it would be, but we said to ourselves, hey, we won this one. We can win the next one. And it was that early victory that made us see what possibility was. And I don't think we understood how tough it would be, how large the, the problem really was, but having won once, we knew we could win again. And I knew we could win again. We could do it again. We'd have to change our techniques, change our direction, change this, but we could do it again. So there was a kind of empowerment for yeah, you absolutely. personally. Absolutely. We ask our, in, our interviewees about leadership and what creates it. There are many different answers offered, but certainly many of them believe that circumstances create the catalyst for leaders to emerge in a particular culture. Their memories of Brown and the civil rights movement are primarily memories of empowerment. Their memories of family, of education, of mentors, of networks and connections are also memories of empowerment. Identities were rooted to and drew strength from social solidarities linked to a kind of oppositional consciousness. From these experiences, the potential for a generation of leaders was created. Ultimately, these personal stories told by a diverse group of African American leaders provide rich examples of how formative experiences, historical circumstances, chance encounters provide the basis and opportunity for leadership. These are stories of overcoming odds, of rising to the occasion, of stepping up. We know that a huge number of people in America still represent an underclass. And ultimately, I hope that through the website and the book, that these stories will be illustrative and empowering to others or at the very least can educate us at about what mattered most to a group of leaders themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phyllis, uh, for this absolutely fascinating talk. Uh, and we have about half an hour um, time for your comments and questions. If you can please wait for the microphone since we're webcasting this event. Um, and state your name and affiliation, if you like. And as promised, the, f the, the backbenchers will be called on first. So, Eric. Eric Arneson from George Washington University and a fellow here at the Wilson Center. Um, th this was, was fascinating, and I have a million questions, but <laughs> will only ask a few. Um, first, uh, I'm very curious, not having seen the website and not knowing who else you've interviewed, why these folks? Right. They seem remarkably, how shall I put this, familiar. Um, uh, I mean, these are folks we've seen, at least in some cases, interviewed multiple times before. Presumably, there are countless numbers of leaders who are not uh, as nationally known, uh, who may not be college educated, who work in community or labor organizations, 
do they show up uh, in, in this project? And second, um, I'm curious about uh, Brown and the way in which this project fits into scholarship. Not everyone would agree that Brown was as seminal an event uh, in sparking the civil rights movement uh, as you and your interviewees seem to suggest. I believe your colleague at Virginia, uh, uh, Michael Klarman, uh, has a very different view on this. Uh, others have periodized the movement uh, uh, quite, quite differently. Um, it's possible that after so much time uh, and the nature of the questions that are posed that they come back to this, but I'm wondering how this squares with the scholarship that suggests that Brown, yes, was important, but may not have been as important as these folks uh, seem to suggest it was. Thank you very much. Suddenly the back row cleared out. Um, <laughs> anyhow, Phyllis. Well, those are wonderful questions. Let me start with that. Um, your first question, why these folks? Um, as I said when I started, our goal was to try to get a cross-section of leaders from different parts of the country, uh, men, women, from different time periods. Um, I would suggest that, um, that not, although perhaps some of the clips that I've shown today are people who are familiar to you, I don't think all of our people are quite as familiar, although in truth, uh, we, are, we have for the most part looked at leaders who have risen uh, to, to positions of some prominence in the society. So it, it, to us, it represents a cross-section. We understand that there are some we probably haven't gotten to that we should have. Um, uh, people who work uh, more in, in grassroots kinds of organizations, and that would be wonderful if we could get to those people as well. But you still had a logic of selection. I mean, as any historian, we, right. we, we choose which stories, we choose which documents. So I, I, I would pile on top of Eric's question, what's the logic of selection when you began? How did you say, well, we're going to pick these 50 as opposed to all these other possibilities. What's the <laughs> logic that you chose? The, the, the logic, as I've already said, was a cross-section of men and women, people uh, in, in, from different parts of the country, people who represented uh, very many different career orientations because it was about leadership and so we weren't just looking at leadership in politics or leadership in education uh, we wanted to look at at leadership in a in a in a diversity of career trajectories to see what it was that people thought had been most important to them uh, in developing that leadership so uh, you know so, so that really was the logic. Um, we started out getting to older people first, so Oliver Hill and Dorothy Height were fairly early on. Um, we, um, w we started out trying to begin, actually, we began each year, I think, uh, uh, trying to look at a particular path to leadership. So we started out with the law. Uh, five years before the, or four years before the 50th anniversary of the Brown decision. Then we went to education. Then we went to leaders in, um, in uh, uh, religious institutions and in the church. Um, and then we tried to diversify further. So that was, that was the basic logic of the choice. Um, and for all the 50 that we've chosen, or almost 50 that we've chosen, there could be another <coughs> 250, 300, whatever, that, that we could have gone to. In terms of your issue about scholarship, um, I, I know that there's a, a diverse um, set of, of uh, scholars who don't think Brown is, is that important. Um, and and in the chapters that I'm writing, I'm trying to create some of the context for that in addition to the things that individual people say. Um, to me, it is stunning, however, as to how many of them, of these people in our sample, 
do say that Brown was fundamentally important to them in terms of giving, providing them with examples and role models of what could be accomplished. So I think there's a difference between Brown being a success in terms of what it accomplished in the educational realm and perhaps Brown being inspirational for a generation of people who thought that they could then um, that that they could 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 then um, push at at the at the boundaries uh, and and create this larger change in the society. Thank you. Yes, we'll go to the gentleman over here. Okay, we'll go. Then. Yep. Go uh, my name is Bill Pretzer from the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Mm -hmm. um, one comment and one question. Um, there is a congressionally mandated oral history project being conducted by the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian Institution um, uh, about the participants in the civil rights movement, so a different focus where the, uh, the mandate is individuals who have not already been um, uh, interviewed uh, in oral histories, that is to provide uh, new information about people who haven't been extensively interviewed. And one of the first things that group did was to examine and survey other repositories to see who, who already had been interviewed and who was not. And then the issue of trying to collect from people, uh, interview people who were very elderly before they passed on. To, and that's a, a project that started with an initial 50 interviews that are currently online at the Library of Congress through the Civil Rights Oral History Project and going on to another 75 additional interviews over the course of the next year or so. Mm -hmm. um, the, the quest, so there's another resource. The, the question is, did the name Emmett Till ever come up? And if so, <laughs> when and by whom? <laughs> the name Emmett Till came up constantly. Um, it, it came up by, uh, I mean, I'm, I would, I would have, tr uh, w one could actually search our website uh, and put in the name Emmett Till and all the different interviews would come up in which it was mentioned, so one could find that out very easily. But it came up constantly by, uh, by those people who saw themselves, um, uh, who, who, who perceived that they might have been Emmett Till. and. Um, you know, John Lewis, Julian Bond, people who were in their teenage years when the Emmett Till murder took place, uh, talk about that as uh, just a, a chilling moment of realization, uh, and actually as a motivational moment, not as a discouraging mo moment, as a time when they understood that there was no choice but to get involved because, you know, this so easily could have been them. So, um, yeah, em Emmett, Emmett Till is a constant source of reference in terms of uh, the reason why it was necessary to fight, fight for change. Thank you. All the way in the back, and then we'll go to um, Philippa Strum. Um, my name is Joe Freeman. I'm a senior scholar here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, I was involved in the Civil Rights Movement for four years in the 60s, including uh, 18 months with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, mostly in Alabama. I'm currently writing a book about it. There are three kinds of statistical back breakdowns I would like to know about your sample. Um, one is how many of your sample were educated in the North versus being educated in the South? The second um, is, do you have anything on class background? How many were children of the middle class? I realize they all became middle class by becoming leaders, but how many were children of the middle class versus children of the working class or its rural equivalent, such as a, a tenant sharecropper? And my third one is, organizationally, how do they divide up? Because most leaders tend to specialize by organization. You don't find too many who are, in mul who are heading multiple organizations. Julian Baum might be an exception to that, but um, bo so how do organizationally, how does it break down? I think I understand the first two questions. I may have to ask for clarification on, on the third uh, section of it. Um, as I said when I began, we 
um, don't see this as a statistical sample, so I can't give you many specifics in terms of exactly how this breaks out. Um, just reflecting on our sample. I think, I'd have to go back and, and really do this study for you, but I think that probably, um, pro probably a pretty even split between North and South, although I'm not absolutely sure of that, but I think so. In, in terms of class issues, that's very tough because uh, m many, many of our people came from backgrounds that we would definitely consider uh, backgrounds of poverty. Uh, and how many? I mean, again, I, I can't really tell you how many, but certainly many, many, many. <laughs> Uh, who would have seen themselves as coming from from backgrounds of real poverty, from broken homes, from uh, uh, homes in which there there was inadequate money for education, etc. Um, they didn't necessarily think of themselves as poor, so you know the class issues I think are complicated in terms of really trying to to explain some of these divisions or, or categorize people so clearly. And the third question is about organizational affiliation. For example, uh, William Bond and John Lewis are mostly known for their association with Smith. Uh, several people who came from the Yeah, um, how they broke out. So, so it, I'm just I'm just having trouble understanding uh, how to answer that question effectively because they, to me, they represent a very uh, a very broad sample of of different organizations. I mean, uh, if you're just you're just talking about civil rights organizations yeah. now, yeah. J just the civil rights organizations during the civil rights movement. Um, well, John Lewis was certainly part of SCLC. We we can't hear any of this, uh, the viewers. So we, if you if if we have a dialogue here, it has to. Okay, I mean, if I if I were labeling Lewis is mostly associated with SNCC. He was on the SCLC board, but he was put on the board precisely because he was the chairman of SNCC, and that's what SCLC wanted. So I was just trying to look for a rough, you know, you've got a sample here of people. It's not a. It's not a statistical sample. You've got a collection of people. Uh, you know, you got. You have five Snickers and ten double ACPers and one SCLC. I'm just. That's all I was trying to get was a rough breakdown of how people's primary organizational affiliation uh, was reflected in um, your your collection of interviewees. Yeah, I guess. I guess my answer is that we didn't look at that very carefully. We looked at people who we thought we would be interesting to talk to. Um, so we didn't we didn't break it down that way. Okay, and I'm one of the uh, one of the beautiful things about this database is that you can now go uh, yourself and um, and uh, uh, draw those samples. Um, so, uh, Flip, Philippa Strum. Philippa Strum from the Wilson Center. Thanks so much, Phyllis. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about two things. One is generation, and one is gender. Um, you had said that you have interviews with much younger people, and I wonder if you're finding the same characteristics, the same phenomena, important in your analysis of how and why they became leaders. And then the same kind of question about gender, since we're talking about African American women who had the double oppression, did you see anything different in their trajectory to leadership? You know, 
I really thought we would see major differences across generation, and one of the things that uh, I guess informs this book is that um, at the end of the day, I, I felt that there was a larger similarity than dissimilarity between the stories. Certainly, there's no question that um, you know people, uh, as as time went on and empowered by some of the changes that had occurred in America, had a had a greater sense of possibility, and yet. The stories that they tell about themselves, the memories that they have, um, all speak to the same kinds of influences in their lives. And I, 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 found, I found, found that very impressive and interesting. So certainly their circumstances were different generationally. I mean, you can't say that somebody like Dorothy Height um, came from the same historical circumstances as, as someone like, you know, Bakari Sellers. Um, and yet they speak about the same influences. The in, their, their lives are, are fundamentally different, but the things that they attribute to their leader, to the potential for their leadership seem remarkably the same. Um, as far as, and that's, and that's why I think these stories are in fact so compelling, because I think they do cut across time. Um, as, as for the gender issues, there definitely was, and, and, and uh, in the minds of these people, a, a sense of a kind of uh, double oppression. Um, and uh, for so many of the women, I think they really did come from, from families that, uh, that never, that never um, discourage them from being what they wanted to be. So an Elaine Jones, Mary Futrell, Vivian Pinn, who's in our sample, who I think was going to be here today, but I'm not sure she is. Um, y you know, they, they tell amazing stories about parents who never stop them from thinking they could be doctors or lawyers or whatever. And so, you know, they were, there was a kind of empowerment that came from that. My name is Stephen Shore. Um, it was, I think, A.P. Hartley, the novelist, who said, the past is a foreign country. People mm -hmm. do things differently there. And I remember watching Eyes on the Prize and finding it, with each passing year, harder to believe that this was America in my lifetime, which I know consciously it was. And it may be an unfair question to ask, what would Ken Burns have done? <laughs> but in, in trying to um, vi revivify the past, are the most articulate group of interview interviewees sufficient, or did, were you ever tempted to supplement the material, the actual interviews, with newsreel footage, which it, it can be marvelous in recreating uh, casts of mind that mercifully are, are less present with, if not wholly vanished, less present with us than they were a half a century ago. Pass the microphone. Ken Burns would have given a Shelby foot, but that's besides the uh, point. Pass the microphone down to the next gentleman, but Phyllis, go ahead. Hmm? Um, I have definitely looked at other materials besides the interviews themselves, <laughs> um, and and uh, uh, I've read, you know, lots of contextual material. Certainly, looked. You're you're asking specifically about film footage or just other contextual materials from the Times. Out as an example, you have he'd have interviews with talking heads, periodic music or <laughs> periodic um, newsreels where possible, where you see the 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 actual circumstances and environments that people lived in at the yeah. times. For example, especially the first volume of Eyes on the Prize get, gets you back to this uh, this world that is very hard, conceptually hard to believe that this was the United States once. Well, I mean, certainly the context for the book seeks to do that, seeks to paint that, that background picture. I mean, what I've tried to do today is to, I guess, give an overview of all of the chapters. So it's clearly been impossible to go into any detail about some of the, you know, some, some of the, the um, um, subtlety that's woven, hopefully woven into this, um, 
but absolutely, there's lots of other material that I've been using. This is Francisco Rodriguez from George Washington University. And first, uh, congratulations for a nice presentation and very illuminating uh, project. Um, I would like to ask you about a question of how, um, which, which, which lessons from this group of people could we learn from the, let's say, the, not the history, but the current situation of uh, African American, because they were talking about success, they were talking about progress, but if you look now to the to the reality, the African Americans still suffer, for instance, an unemployment rate higher than the, than the rest of the people. So, which were the lessons that you could please drag from those examples, and if it's possible, to apply to the situation now? I think <laughs> it's a complicated question, but. Uh, What I hope is is that this talk today has highlighted some I some of what I think are the lessons, and that is to say that I believe that what we learn from this sample of people uh, does does offer some guidance for today. Um, exactly how we accomplish. That, in the world we live in, is, of course, much more complicated. But I think um, uh, to reinforce uh, the, the incredible uh, importance of, um, of mentors, of, of uh, family members, of extended kin, of, um, of an educational system that works for people and empowers people, uh, um, of institutions that give people a sense of, of confidence and, and uh, solidity for the future. I, I would say that those are some of the lessons that I think these uh, interviews offer us. Um, and I would also say that in the memories and, and ideas that people share, um, they also of course, these are, these are people who have been remarkably successful, but they also, um, I think, uh, talk about the incredible importance in their own lives of um, resisting a kind of diminishment that sometimes they felt was all around them and, and struggling to not let those circumstances constrain them. Um, I think uh, there is, throughout these interviews, an enormous influence, which I did not get into, um, on the importance of, and, and a phrase that comes back over and over again that's just a, a kind of uh, uh, sort of uh, almost a mythos within the African American community of, of lifting others as you climb. That comes up over and over and over again, and just not something I had a chance to say, but how, how incredibly important people think that was for them and also for the future. I'm going to also argue that part of the lessons that come from this is the power and importance of history. There was something that Julian Bond said in this interview when he said, having won, won. And for 90 years, remember, the tradition, the assumption was that Reconstruction was a failure. Reconstruction was tragic. And when Bond tells us having won one matters, and for 90 years, p African Americans being taught that the one that they won was a failure, the Civil War and Reconstruction, it matters. So I think that's part of what you get from this, is that it does matter how we construct our history. Uh, that Bond is saying, we gained confidence from winning one. So when history takes away that confidence, it matters. Thank you. Um, okay, we have, we're almost out of time. I've got way too many people on my list, but let's maybe take, we'll take a, a few at a time, Phyllis, and then I'll give you one last chance to respond to most of them, I hope. So mm -hmm. we'll go to Dorothy Bork first, and the gentleman in the red sweater, and then to uh, the lady in the red sweater back there. And have I, is anybody else that I've overlooked? And yes, all the way in the back there. So go ahead, Dorothy. Well, 
I, I wondered if you had tried to compare, to some extent, the, the sample and the answer that you're getting with leadership, uh, with oral histories, and I suspect there are leadership studies in other ethnic communities, uh, in other sorts of um, s roots of success, realms of success. It, it strikes me that while the historical circumstances are indeed very particular, uh, and would be to some extent for each one, that, that there's also an enormous, there might be an enormous similarity um, between, uh, say, um, you know, leaders in, in other kinds of ethnic communities uh, in the United States or, um, leadership in the law in general, or leadership in medicine in general, business in general. Uh, it seems to me that would be worth looking into. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we'll go to, uh, if you could pass the microphone to the gentleman right there. Derek Musgrove from the University of the District of Columbia. Um, I wanted to revisit uh, Eric Arneson's question, but not from a methodological, but it's sort of a historical memory uh, point of view. And when I was watching John Lewis, uh, even Julian Bond, your collaborator, although he wasn't actually being interviewed, but uh, Dorothy Height, I, I recall that many of them had flirted with black power at certain points in their careers. Many of them had embraced a deep pessimism about the possibility for reform in the United States. And they weren't speaking about those moments in their lives in this interview, perhaps because the interview was structured around Brown and the progress since. And, and I, I might be oversimplifying find that, but bear with me. Uh, and so I'm wondering if there's sort of a politics of political memory here where they're saying, look, let me tell you how I got here, which then becomes a success narrative, right? Uh, it's not a question about the, the, the explosion of the prison industrial complex or uh, the fact that the Joint Center just came out with a report that says 5% of black elected officials in the South are in the majority these days and therefore, you know, they have no power. It's, it's a discussion of, you know, how they got from there to here. Um, and I, I'm curious if you all talked about how that might have bent the narrative that you get out of the interviews. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great question. And we'll go all the way in the back. We'll, and then we'll, we'll work ourselves. Uh, Maurice, Jackson, right the room. Uh, Maurice Jackson, Georgetown, and also at the, with a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson. Uh, I, I guess it's not a bad thing that you have more questions uh, when you leave than when you came in. But, but, but I have a, a few. For example, I, I, I don't understand. I guess I'm grappling with why this is so different than, let's say, what uh, the National Visionary uh, Project did when Camille Cosby and, um, and, and uh, Rene Poussaint went out and interviewed hundreds of people and, and left footage, and, and God knows what's been done with it, but, but, but it's been done. Uh, it, it's there. And so it, it, I'm trying to get the purpose and the redoing of, of this and, 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 and putting the things together. Now, just on the question of Brown, because it is, it, 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 it is a major reinterpretation. It's almost like no one did anything before. It. E even Professor Glassman, I mean, black people never thought Reconstruction was a failure. Who, who, you know, it, it just was. That's Chester Bowles and people like that. But the idea with the Civil Rights Movement was to be that second Reconstruction. So, so I, I guess what I'm trying to get is, 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 is what is the end goal of, of all this? What makes this so exceptional? Because you keep saying it's except, but I want to know what makes it that way. And, uh, and, 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 and the people chosen, you know, a couple of times it, it was obvious there when I saw it, some people almost had nostalgia. You, you saw it a couple of times uh, 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 when before this we had, you know, it was almost like this, there was glory days of the black family and things like that, a, cu a couple there. <laughs> and there was no such thing. There were no days uh, 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 when, when people looked back and the black family was all so tight that, that you could go there and the problems would be solved because you had to go in the whiter world. So you, you, you have raised some questions there that, to me, really need answering, and, and they are serious questions. Thank you very much. And now, finally, wow. <coughs> thanks for your patience. Thank you very much, and I'm glad to be last, if not least. Uh, Lorna Grenadier, formerly of the Justice Department Civil Rights Division. And very quick questions, maybe following up a little bit on an earlier one. One is, to what extent do your findings on leadership transfer to all U.S. society or even international? Are these unique to the African-American community or the United States? 
or can they be uh, transferred abroad? And then finally, to what extent do you, would you see your findings informing public policy to encourage leadership uh, everywhere? Thank you. Thank you, though I think that that last question Phyllis already partially answered earlier. So, Phyllis, final round of <laughs> response. 30 words or less. <laughs> I think I'd like to address the questions that that deal with um, uh, the politics of memory and the nostalgia element I in these interviews, um, and then perhaps try to say something about whether they're similar or dissimilar to other groups. There's no doubt in my mind that there is a a uh, politics of memory and that in many cases that people's memories are softened with time and that they are um, that they that they are um, in a sense um, stories of success in which no doubt people forget the parts of the story that uh, are not so comfortable uh, or, or perhaps are, are not connected uh, to, to their current state of being. Uh, that does seem to me to be part of the nature of oral history and part of the nature of memory, which is why I started with some of the in initial quotes about memory that I did. Nonetheless, I, I think if this is the way people are remembering their lives, and this is what they're saying about what was significant and central to their lives, um, that these stories are worth hearing and worth sharing. Um, I understand that many of them are feel-good stories um, and, and may, uh, may not fully reflect some of the complexities of, of lives and complexities of families. Um, and, you know, my hope is that that's part of the reason for the more contextual materials of the book, which, you know, hopefully when it gets published, uh, uh, people will be able to determine whether that's, that's been handled or not. Um, uh, memory is faulty, we know that, um, and memory is selective. Uh, but to the extent that the memories themselves create that kind of map in which people can move forward in their lives, then I still think those memories become quite significant and important. Um, now, in, in terms of other groups and, uh, and, and the connection transnationally, um, uh, we have not, I have not yet uh, tried to study the relationship between these stories and, and other ethnic groups. Um, I think that would be a, a, a very worthwhile thing to do. It would be a different project and a different book and would have to wait for some <laughs> future point in time. Um, are these uh, transferable abroad? Are they, put, are, they, are they important for public policy? I don't know if they're transferable abroad, but I do think they're important for public policy. And I think they're important because, um, simply because I do think that these shared memories do tend to emphasize so many of the same factors, whether they are, um, whe whether they are nostalgic or in somewhat apocryphal or not, uh, nonetheless 50 uh, people who've had very successful lives are saying that these are important things. And so, you know, we have a group of black leaders themselves talking about what they perceive to be important. Good. Well, we're uh, over time. Uh, as uh, Professor Jackson reminded us, every good session uh, brings out more questions than it answers. I think this session has done that, and we're all indebted to Phyllis Leffler for a very, very a fascinating, stimulating afternoon. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you very much.